Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we have a good guest for you this week, Michael Cooper, who is the author of Help My Facebook Ads Suck. So we're going to be asking him all about kind of mastering Facebook advertising and maybe like author pages and groups and, and what exactly we should be doing on there to, that could actually help us sell books. I love uh, that book title, by the way. That is freaking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, and just to, as an introduction, Michael is a software veteran of 20 years, has owned several small businesses, and worked for a number of startups. He worked closely with marketing departments to ensure that products were built to match customer needs, and then also helped in their marketing. So he's both tech savvy, tech savvy, and marketing capable. I warned Michael ahead of time I can't read these intros, and I would screw it up. So he was prepared. Uh, combined with his love of writing, he has been able to craft and tune many, many dozens of Facebook ads to provide ROIs as high as 500 hundred percent on items as inexpensive as ebooks. Excellent. I have an ROI of like negative 500%. So we're almost the same. <laughs> uh, but why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe uh, if you want to talk about your fiction that you've done too. Sure. Right? Well, yeah, you took away all, all, took up all the interesting parts there. I, uh, I used to write software. Actually, I really liked writing software because it's creative work. But um, when I got the opportunity to actually write fiction full time, I jumped at that because, you know, that's, that's the dream pretty much. Um, and, and actually the whole reason why I write fiction full time now is because of Facebook ads. Um, I published my first book in 2012 and between 2012 and 2016, I think maybe 400 people read that book. Um, and I, and early, well, it might be a little more, maybe a thousand, you know, over four years. And I published my third book, um, in June of last year. And in, uh, August, um, uh, my wife actually started running Facebook ads. Uh, she took Mark Dawson's course and started running Facebook ads for me. I never took Mark Dawson's course myself, so I don't want to feel bad about stealing anything from him. Um, but I might have done it through proxy with my wife a little bit. But what happened was we started running Facebook ads and experimenting with them and playing around with the, the different things we could do and, and looking at what advice there is and um, started to sell a lot more books. And I went from nobody reading my books in August to having a $25,000 a month in October. So it, uh, and that was basically due to Facebook ads. There was no other marketing that we were doing. I think we did like a, a couple of news, uh, paid promos, like a book barbarian and stuff like that. So everything else came out of Facebook ads. And at that point we had wrapped the spend from in early August, it was $5 a day. And then in, in, um, October we were spending about a hundred dollars a day on Facebook ads. And it was awesome. Yeah, I was, was going to ask, you didn't spend 30,000 to make that 25,000, did you? Cause that's how it would work if I tried to do it. Yeah. Yeah, and so so I, and I the the group I spend most of my I should spend waste lose most of my time in is is the twenty books to fifty k group, um, although I've been more disciplined lately. But uh, I would constantly see authors saying that they couldn't get Facebook ads to work, and they would be spending all this time on Facebook ads trying to get them to work, and it it kind of dismayed me because I'm like, you know, if you guys just figured this out, there's a lot of these authors are writing really good books, and I, I like their books, and I want to see them succeed. But also, I was jealous or not jealous, um, selfish. Cause I want to read more of their books, but they're working full-time jobs, you know? So I'm like, ah, oh, these guys could just get out of this full-time job thing and write more books. I could read more of their books and I'd be a happier person. So that was my, uh, my entirely selfish goal. So I wrote a bunch of posts, um, just sort of explaining how to tell people could do Facebook ads and make them work for them. Cause there's a lot of little, little nuances that people don't understand about Facebook ads where Facebook tells you if your ad is good or not, and people don't know where to look to find that out. Um, and if Facebook doesn't think your ad's good, it's going to charge you more money for that and show it that ad and show it less often. So I, I wrote up a series of posts about that and people posted saying, please write a book about this because I would like to know more. And um, so I did that. I put together a book called Help My Facebook Ads Suck because the whole goal was I wanted to help people that were had done Facebook ads. They knew the they knew what they were trying to do. You know, they'd worked through the interface. They understood you know, how to create an ad and whatnot, but they didn't understand why they weren't working. So the whole point of the book is to explain, first off, is can you even run Facebook ads and make money doing it? And then after that is how do you determine if your ad is making money and then how to fix it if it's not. Um, that's that's pretty much the gist of what I was trying to do. Whereas a lot of a lot of the courses that are, that are teaching about Facebook ads, they're more about how to use Facebook to make ads and they might be about writing, mark, writing ad copy and whatnot. And I'm all about how to find out if the ad's working and how to tweak it until it does work. Awesome. Uh, we have a whole bunch of Facebook questions for you. I am curious, how many books did you actually have out when you were able, when you had that big month and were able to quit your job? Um, 
in October, I had three books out. That's amazing. And were you, are yeah. you doing science fiction? Did I see or? Yep. Oh, yeah, right, science cool. fiction. You're totally yeah, welcome I on have, our uh, show then. <laughs> it's kind of funny actually, because I know, I know Liz, you write a lot of science fiction and are, we never share also bots. It's kind of a strange thing. I'm uh, actually, great, I, I think a lot of the guys write really hard. I mean, I actually don't even know who you are on there, uh, but <laughs> write the military sci-fi and I'm a little lighter, mm -hmm. campier space adventure stuff. So I think right. I tend to be in also bots of other female authors a lot. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe you're in with the guys, I don't know, but I, I do get readers that are male, you know, writing that say they read the books. So cool. You never know. Maybe we'll hang together sometime. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that would be, that's actually an interesting little marketing tactic, by the way, is to look for people who write in your genre that aren't in your also bots. Cause obviously then their readers are not yet your readers. So you can, you can do a newsletter swap with them and you're going to encounter new people. Oh, it's a, um, a handy tip. <clears throat> yeah, nothing okay. to do with Facebook, but hey. Well, hey, we we uh, we don't need to limit. We go on tangents plenty, but uh, <laughs> uh, so I guess my first question would be: um, It sounds like, well, how did you really construct your Facebook strategy? It seems like you you got a reasonably high level of success in relatively short order. Uh, was it a lot of trial and error? Like it seems like you sort of didn't directly take your your cues from experts. So like, sort of, how did it come together? So I I did. Um... I did do a lot of trial and error, and a lot of it was was like, I want to make a nice, this nice looking ad. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I don't care what anyone says, I'm going to make my ad and it's going to work. And at the same time, my wife was making ads, following the advice of some of the other people around, around and her ads were working great. And I'm like, crap, I think, I think I know what I'm doing. I've done marketing. I've done all these different things, and I just can't make a Facebook ad for the life of me. So I, I basically took my ego and I, I put it over there, and I started really playing around with different types of ads. And, um, and looking at work. And I've been doing, you know, tangentially involved in advertising for quite a while, but it was in big advertising, you know, selling selling like $50,000 products and stuff like that, which is a very different type of advertising because you have all these different touch points and you want to sort of build, you know, get people into your funnel and manually work them through your funnel and whatnot. And with the book, we're selling something in many cases that's 99 cents for the first for the first thing we're selling. So we can't, um, <clears throat> we can't have a long funnel. We need to get someone to look at our, our ad and theoretically buy that book the very next step because you know we're competing on in, on Facebook. There's authors selling 99 cent doll cents, and then there's people selling MacBooks and cars and washing machines and whatnot. And they can pay a lot more money um, to uh, to get a click that we can afford to do. So a lot of it was um, adjusting my mindset to to get people what they want. And what it turns out to be is there's a couple of really basic tenets to running good Facebook ads. The number one rule of Facebook ads is don't put a picture of your book on your Facebook ad. Um, that is a great way to spend a whole bunch of money and have no one do anything have, have it, that you want, aka buying your book. Um, now, a lot of, now, Facebook used to actually completely disallow ads with text on them. And then one day, Facebook said, fine, we give up. You can put pictures with text on your ad. And everybody went out and did that. But Facebook still doesn't like that because Facebook actually doesn't want to look like a big, long string of ads. They want to look like interesting, relevant content. So they want um, ads that just look like someone, look not too much different than someone posting a picture of the meal they are about to eat. Hopefully not the meal they just ate, but the meal they're about to eat. Uh, I almost said that, that I did anyway. Um, so it's, it, was, it was understanding um, as, much, as much as anything else what Facebook wants to show as, as, um, as what people want to see. And then the other thing I thought about a lot about was um, I hate stuff that's just selling into my face. Uh, you know, when you go on Facebook and like, here's this thing, it's great, you should buy it now, it's, it's this percent off or something like that. I just, I can't stand it. And I figured, you know, if I can't stand, I mean, I know I'm weird, so there is a small percentage of the population that actually aligns themselves with the way I think, but I figured, you know what, there's gotta be a bunch of other weird people out there like me. So maybe if I can figure out, uh, if I can write the kind of ad I'd be interested in reading, maybe I'll find a bunch of other people that that also like the, that, that sort of thing. And in theory, they might like the books I write too. Um, so I wrote long copy ads. I, my ads um, are sometimes seven or eight paragraphs or longer in some cases. Um, and the thing I realized is that if I'm going to try and sell my storytelling skills to someone, I should probably try and tell a story rather than say, you know, pot, great reviews, must buy or something like that. Um, so I, I focused on that. And I have an ad, actually, this partic one particular ad, um, I've been running it now since November. 
Um, it's had 450,000 impressions at this point now. I basically own this picture. If anyone ever tries to use this one picture on a book cover, they're screwed because I have now shown this to basically half a million science fiction authors and they associate it with me, even though it's not a picture that's on any of my books. Um, it's the big back end of a big starship. I call starship ass. It's like, it's like space porn. Um, and so I, I, I put that ad up and that ad is basically, it's, it's a plot based ad that, um, just tells, um, a plot story about what's going to happen in the books. And it's actually even got a typo in the second word. And every now and then someone gives me a hard time about it. But with Facebook, if you change the text, you lose all of your all of your um, social proof that's on that ad. You lose all your comments and whatnot. And this ad now has 248 comments. And it's got closing in 3,000 3, likes and got five or 600 shares or something like that. So I'm not going to touch it, typos and all. And actually, people get in fights in this ad too. It's, it's great fun. Um, but the great thing is Facebook doesn't care if people are fighting on your ad. They think they, they say comments are good. So yeah, actually having engagement. Exactly. Yeah. As far as Facebook's concerned, this is fantastic. So so that, I've actually done that before. I've put ads out there. I've actually put ads out there. I don't run them for too long because they can be emotionally draining. But things like is is MD Cooper the, the next Larry Niven? Or put something put out an ad like that. And you'll get all sorts of fun comments on there. And then after I'll be like, I can't handle this anymore, you turn it off because there's two people saying hell no. Uh, but but it could be it could be quite good from an ad strategy. So I, I did a lot of playing around with that, writing long copy, writing short copy, focusing on character-based ads versus plot-based ads. Um, and, and they both actually work very well. And I, I learned over time, uh, men respond better to, to plot-based ads and women respond better to character-based ads, which really shouldn't be that shocking to, to most people if you kind of think about, about even how movies are presented when they do movie trailers, you know, from who the, which, which genre they're aiming or uh, gender they're aiming at, they'll, they'll do those differently. And, um, and I, like, you, like I said, I did a lot of testing. And part of the thing in my book I described, too, is I say, OK, you're not going to write the perfect ad the first time out. Just like your first novel wasn't perfect, um, your first ad is not going to be perfect either. And in fact, you're probably going to screw up three or four times before you get a really good ad. And Facebook takes 500 um, impressions of your ad to tell you whether or not your ad sucks. They have a little thing called the relevancy score. And if you have to drill all the way down to the ad tab to see that, you'll see a relevancy score. And if that relevancy score is below seven, Facebook is basically saying your ad is garbage and or you're showing it to the wrong audience. Therefore, we're going to charge you a lot more money to show that ad because Facebook doesn't want to look like a big long string of ads. They want to look like interesting, relevant content for their for their uh, for their viewers. So once I understood that, I I realized that a lot of times you'll run. Um, you know, so you'll, if you're running five dollars a day, and uh, most time most people are paying about thirty cents a click is kind of where most ads will start out at. It takes about five, it takes about two to three days to get five hundred impressions, and then when you get that five hundred impressions, Facebook gives you a little score for your relevancy, and you you know if your if your ad's good or not. Not um, a lot of times, Facebook also will um, tell you very quickly if your ad's good or not because they'll start charging a buck fifty per click. And that's a pretty good answer too that your ads <laughs> not a, not a very good ad. Um, so so once I learned about that, I, I learned you know, how Facebook was telling me if my ad was good or not, then I was able to experiment a lot faster. Um, and there'll be some periods where I'll be running 15 to 20 different ads. I'm experimenting with different ones, trying them out and, and seeing which work. And the other thing is that, um, this comes back to the images that I sort of touched on briefly and then, and then disappeared from. Um, different images work better for different people. And so what I'll do is I'll write ad copy and I'll, I'll go um, to deposit photos and I'll grab 15 images that I think work nicely with that, that ad copy. Cause I, I maybe got 15 because I've got quite the, a stable now of images, but um, I got that AppSumo deal a while back where you get like a hundred downloads for like 20 bucks or something. Um, and I just grab a deposit, deposit photo or, or Adobe stock photos, um, have subscriptions on a bunch of those. And I just stick those right in for my ads. I don't modify them. Um, I don't tweak them or anything like that. I just take that image, put it up there for the ad. And if it works great, if it doesn't, then I'll, I'll swap it out that image and put in another one. Sometimes if I think if, if I'm like, I really believe in this particular ad copy, I, I feel like, you know, at this moment of genius when I wrote it, I'll actually put four or five of them up, the exact same copy, just different images. And I'll see which one works best. And I'll just nuke the other ones and keep running the one that works best. Uh, that's something that you can do, obviously, when you've got a little more disposable income to spend on your ads. You can't really start, you know, dropping 50, 60 bucks a day on ads when you're first starting it out to see if it works. So in the book, I talk about that. I say, okay. Um, you're going to have three duds and you're going to spend three days each to determine if they're duds before you get a hit, which means you have to first off just be willing to take 45 bucks and be willing to throw that away. Um, if you don't have $45 you're willing to throw away, then you might need to save up a little bit before you can run ads. The other thing is that if it's May 1st and you're running ads, um, this is where I'm going to screw up the months and look like an idiot, Amazon is not going to pay you for any books you sell on May 1st until May, June, July, 
the very beginning of, of uh, October, August is when you get paid for that May 1st sale. Which means if you're going to run $5 a day of ads for those three months, you're going to drop 450 bucks before you see the first dollar for the first book you sold. So you have to actually be prepared to spend a little bit of money before you start to see that return. So I talk about that in my book too. I say, you know, what's your what's your what's your budget? What's your tolerance for this sort of thing? Because some people will, if you can't sustain the ad and sustain the growth you're trying to build, you're you're wasting your time to a certain extent. Um, because if you know, as you start to build up your rank on your book and you start to get more word of mouth and you start to get the ball rolling, if you do all of that and then realize, shoot, you know, forty five days in, I'm out of money, then all of that momentum goes away. So it's it's ideally better, you know, to to have some cash and, and hopefully not to put in credit cards. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of that that uh, I talk about in the book, about getting ready. And then, of course, there's other things, too, like you have to be able to buy some stock photos and have a little bit of money for that. So it's, it, come, it comes down to the money to make money thing. Um, and then I talk about, um, I think I might have completely wandered away from the question you asked now. So stop me if you, if you want me to get back on point. But then I talk about um, your read through is a really, really big part of the book as well. Because like I mentioned, you're, you're selling something for 99 cents. Um, some people are brave. Some people try to run Facebook ads for things that are three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've actually got one guy that's relatively successful that I help that runs ads for um, a book that's seven dollars. Um, the problem is he's got a, it's a bit of a risk. You know, he's going to put a lot of money before he makes each individual, each one of his sales. Um, so the big thing with Facebook ads is you need read through. You um, ideally, it's, the, it's easiest to advertise at the beginning of a series. You know, book one of a series is ninety nine cents. Um, I recommend against advertising perma free because it's it's the read through on perma free these days is so horrible that that you can you can waste a lot of money without without getting any return there. But if you if you have say a five book series and first book is ninety nine cents and say you have a something bad say you have a fifty percent read through you know where from book one on you drop down to fifty percent and then maybe say it stays relatively flat you're going to do on five books I'm gonna do math off the top of my head here now a buck fifty times four is six. Plus, I don't know, was it 30 cents per each? You're going to do maybe about seven or eight bucks um, off of each one of those sales, it, considering counting, assuming that 50% of the people that pick up your first book never carry on, uh, which would be actually a bad read through. If you if you have a 50% drop off between book one and two, you actually need to look at that and, under, and look at your bad reviews actually, and see why you've got that drop off. Um, but that means that that if you if you've got even a 50% read through and you've got a five book series. Your first book is 99 cents. Your next four are 3.99. You'll make seven or eight bucks every single time you sell book one, which is actually sort of an interesting thing. So if you if you if you run an ad for five bucks a day, and you sell one book a day, and you have a five book series, you're going to make three dollars. So you actually, which is actually service. First, if you look at it, you're like, crap, I only sold one book today. That's horrible, right? That sounds like a really bad sales ratio. But if you have a machine where you put five dollars in that machine every time you do, you get eight dollars out. That's a pretty damn good machine. It's better than the stock market, actually, to be honest, um, considering it's a 90 day return. Well, assuming people read relatively quickly, it's maybe maybe 120 days that you would take to get that money out. But uh, that's actually a, a pretty good thing. So that's one of the things I talk about as well that, that I learned myself because I want I've been in, I've been in sales and advertising for a while. I understood ROI. I've been in terribly boring sales meetings where you had to understand if the product you made and the, and the amount of money it took to make it was was be viable or anything. So that was one of the first things I did was was working that out, and and that's sort of the first step to understanding whether or not you you can be successful. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna hand you off to the rest of the people now so they can ask some questions too but this, <laughs> sorry this is going to be, rambled there <laughs> this is going to be a re-listen episode because there is a tremendous amount of good information coming out i'm taking Actually, notes I, while he talks <laughs> i think I, talk, I think everybody is here but but uh, if okay. i talk too fast by the way um, just tell me to slow down I, I do tend to speed up after a while all right i have a viewer question for you from uh, benjamin douglas he's yeah it's asking you were talking about the images you're using is he saying he doesn't put any typography on the images at all just an image that he purchases is that everyone sure. else's understanding of what he said i think so but i like to hear you say it yeah yeah i do um i do zero typography for a couple of reasons one is that people people they, they forget like when you used to run ads say you're running banner ads on on the internet or something like that you just had the picture so you put all this text over the picture people you have to remember with facebook you've got the ad you've got the text underneath the ad, you've got the text above the ad. If it's on a desktop, you've actually got what they call the, the news description or something like that. So you've actually got three places you can, can put text on this ad plus the image. So 
one, you don't need to put a whole bunch of text on the image because you have these other locations to do it. And two, it comes back to what I said, Facebook doesn't want to look like it's got a bunch of ads. Facebook wants to look like it's got a bunch of pictures of cats and dogs and cheeseburgers that are really good looking and stuff like that. Um, that's because that's what their that's what their readers want. And if you got as soon as a user, you know, browsing Facebook sees a picture with a bunch of text on it, that I mean unless it's a meme. I guess if you made your image, your text look like meme text, you can maybe get away with it. You fit in really well. Um, you know, if you had like a cat and something hilarious, that was your, that was your Facebook ad, you'd probably do great. Um, but yeah, they, they do a lot better without text. And um, a part of that is because Facebook wants to show images without text and they will charge you less money and show your images more. Um, I've had a number of debates with people about this too. And like, no, no, I made this gorgeous ad. It's got my book. It's got something funny. It's got a quote. And I said to them, I said, uh, the biggest bet I ever made was hundred dollars. I said, if you um, if you take this take this exact same ad, duplicate it, and I give you some other picture. They put this picture in. If your ad performs better than the one than the exact same one with the picture I gave you, I will give you a hundred dollars to run Facebook. I'll run I'll run a hundred dollars with Facebook ads for you. And um, I've never had to run ads for someone. They've always basically uh, said, "Wow, you just saved my Facebook ads by by convincing me not to do this." In fact, I've had people that saved their entire series just by stopping putting their covers on their ads. They were actually, their ads were will do well enough that it boosted their entire series. Yeah, well, so far as I'm looking at my notes, I'm like, okay, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Okay, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it, okay. <laughs> Good to and, know. And that was sort of the genesis of my book too, because it was all these authors saying, Facebook ads don't work. And I'm sort of saying, I just retired because of Facebook. Well, I didn't retire. I worked more than I ever have before in my life, but you know, I. I, I began to become a full-time author because of Facebook ads, and so that's why like there are there are things you can do to make it work. And that's why the book's title "Help My Facebook Ads Suck." That's what a lot, a lot of people are saying. Awesome. All right, let me hand you back over to Lindsay here for the next question. All right, All right Michael, you're actually getting me excited to try Facebook ads again, and I didn't think anybody could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Because I've, uh, you know, I see what you're saying with the image. Because I, you know, I just did a book bub ads, and it's, you know, you just have the banner, so you gotta throw some text on there, read free and yep. unlimited or something. But in Facebook, yep. I've generally just used the covers because I'm not a graphics person, and I can't. <laughs> I'm inept when it right. comes to making an, a, you know, a snippet. But do you ever use uh, like your book covers without the text, like if you have a cool spaceship? No. Um, well, once or twice I, I have, but the funny thing is, and I'm like, I'm like, this is the perfect book cover. It looks great. The full wrap is gorgeous. I put it up there and it doesn't perform as well as some piece of art that I grabbed off deposit photos for, you know, for 45 cents. Um, every time I think that it's going to do better, they, they don't. And, and a lot of it actually has to do with the, with the, um, with the thing called negative space and the framing of an image. Um, a, a well constructed image is going to have the right kind of spacing around, for example, in your book cover, the spacing is designed, so if you have a character, for example, there's enough room around their head, their head isn't too close to the top, there's no words over their face or something like that. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff about framing an image that you don't want to do. You don't want to have half of their arm cut off on one side and not the other side. And um, and because your, your 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 book cover is like this, if you once you take that and you cut it down like that, and it was my face, you cut it down like that, it just doesn't look good. And and it and the framing can be wrong, and you might be cut it. There's actually there's actually rules about where you crop a human body. That makes people feel comfortable or uncomfortable. Uh, one of them, for example, is you don't crop like right below the elbow because it makes it look like their arm has been amputated. People have these weird reactions to images. So you have to like learn a lot about photography to actually take your, your book cover and crop that thing and make it look good. Whereas if you go up to some professional photo website and you look at images that just look good to you, you know, we're all trained to, you know, unless you're, there are some people who admittedly, and they usually know it, they can't pick out a good looking image for the life of them. But most of us, we look at a picture, we know whether or not it's appealing or not. So you can just go to these sites like deposit photos or stock.adobe.com and you'll find some nice looking pictures that look like they're framed well and they're gonna be wide, which is what Facebook wants. So you don't have to worry about trying to understand, you know, what parts of a human to show and not to show and stuff like that. That you're gonna find good looking images that um, that are already appealing to you. So in theory they should appeal to other people too. All right, so what I'm hearing is that the ideal thing is to find a stock photo of a spaceship with a cat sitting on the bumper. I think you've picked the perfect image there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, don't anybody take it. That's going to be mine yeah. once I find it. I think I think Barry Hutchinson actually has an ad that looks something like that. <laughs> I believe it. His covers are like that. All right. Yeah. Um, so I was curious earlier because you said long copy ads, and I thought unless you're doing a boosted post that you kind of had to get your little 160 characters or whatever it is. No. Are you doing like in the power editor? They're letting you throw in all seven just, paragraphs. Oh, you, can just, you can just type forever in there. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, it's 
and I and I do them for different. Like actually, if I'm running a sale, I'll do I'll do a short ad because it's like okay, what I'm what I'm selling here is is the deal. So I'll be like, you know, normally nine ninety nine, now ninety nine cents or something ridiculous that like that. You know, it'll make you look more attractive to the opposite gender. Your your cats will love you more. It'll be amazing. Um, I should actually write that ad. That'd be kind of funny. Um, and uh, and those that's what I'll do short copy for. But if I'm trying to sell my story, I will write a, a very like usually four or five paragraphs is, is what I write. And people have to click that more link to, to see the whole thing. And, and they do actually because Facebook shows you if, if people are clicking that or not. Yeah, I was curious because if you're like you're on your phone, you're not going to actually see very much of the text. I assume right. you get an ad. I never click on the ads, so maybe I should <laughs> click on some to, to see if that's what they do. Is they take me to a story? <laughs> you actually raise a really interesting point. When you're creating an ad on Facebook, it will sh it has you, you you're making it and you've got it in that stupid little window on the right hand side. There's some little arrows there that you can click to look what look at what that ad's going to look like on all the different um, side screens. So it'll show what mobile looks like. It's going to show what it looks like on Instagram. It's going to show what it looks like on feature phones, which like nobody in North America uses anymore, so they don't matter. Um, it'll show you what they look what the ad's going to look like on what's called the audience network, which is even like inside the games your kids are playing on their iPads or where those things will show up. Even so, you can look at your ad in all those different spots and see yeah, is my text cut off somewhere stupid, or or you know. Actually, mainly is my text cut off somewhere stupid is what you look for. But um, but yeah, so you do want to make sure that like your hook is right at the top, obviously. All right, cool. I'm going to experiment with that because I, you know, I think a lot of us writers are horrible copy writers. You know, we're just so frustrated with trying to make yeah. one sentence to get them. Well, to yeah, click. We, I mean, we write we write long copy all day long, and long copy and short copy are very different skills. So what I say to most writers is like, hey, go where your strengths are. Try and write some longer copy and see how it works. And and um, most people usually say that it works really well for them. In fact, actually, the, there's a, a post uh, should be relatively near the top on the 20 books group, where this one lady posted today um, thanking me for for, for the advice. Because what she did is she actually just took the first two paragraphs or three paragraphs out of her book and put that in as her Facebook ad. And she has one of the best performing Facebook ads I've ever seen. I think she's she's dropped like 116 bucks and had like 2,400 clicks or something like that, which is nice. astounding. She did not yeah, just info dump. She must have had a good nope. hook. <laughs> She actually she had a really good hook. I think she actually got some customers just on that fifty books post. <laughs> well, for somebody maybe who's listening and who's like brand new to Facebook, or maybe they've tried and lost money with it, is there like a, maybe a recommended like how should they start? Just trying to get that for the first ads to the first book. Maybe they've got a series like you were saying, and so they can afford to lose a little bit on the ninety nine mm -hmm. cent book. So yeah, the, the first thing that I always recommend to people is, is um, you need to know when you make money and when you're losing money. Um, anytime, you, anytime you invest on anything, if you're going to invest and you have no way of knowing if it's a profitable investment or not, it's kind of a bad thing. Um, so what I recommend to people first off is, is understanding their ROI. And um, if you go into the 20 books to 50K, and I can, I'll, send, I'll send you guys a link to this as well if you want to post it in the show notes or something like that. Uh, I, have a, I have a spreadsheet in there where you can go in and put in um, it's got a bunch of different versions too. It's got for a five book series, 10 book series, something with a perma free as the first. You put in what all your sales are and what all your reads are, and it will actually tell you what your read through percentages are. And one of the things people discover is most of the time KU readers will read through 80 to 90% of your book. Like you'll you'll see, um, you know, from book one to book two is 80%, and then after that's like 90, 95% of people that, that read that book will keep reading your series. They're uh, mainly because they're all just horrible reading addicts, which we love. Um, people who, who buy books have a lower read through percentage, so you'll you'll actually see a different set of numbers in there. And then what it does is it, it says, okay, you have no idea, first off, for KU, which doesn't apply to everybody. I don't think, Lindsay, I don't think you're in KU, um, if I recall correctly. Just with my um, newest stuff. And my pen name stuff okay. is on there, so continue on. Tell us the uh, secret of well, <laughs> Facebook. I mean, if, anybody's dissatisfied, if anyone's dissatisfied with KU, you're welcome to leave. You know, more money in the pool for, for me over here. I'm bored. <laughs> I always say that to people when they complain about KU. I'm like, well, you should leave. Get on out. The, the pool's only so big here, folks. I know it's a horrible thing to say, isn't it? I apologize. Um, so anyway, I, I talk. Uh, you plug all your numbers in the spreadsheet, and it, the first thing I said is you don't know how many borrows you get um, when, when you run an ad. Um, I use affiliate links to, to track if I'm making sales. You're not supposed to use affiliate links. I freely admit that, and I tell people to, to do that at their own risk. Amazon, uh, Amazon may shut down your affiliate account if you use affiliate links in ads. Um, interesting side note, though, is the links still work. You just don't get paid for them. Um, I use affiliate links for everything. They're my back matter. They're everything. I actually have an entire book that's just affiliate links. It's called My Reading Guide. It describes all my books, and it's all affiliate, affiliate links. Um, please no one report me. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I use affiliate links to see if my ads are working well, um, and I track my, my sales through that. 
And but the thing, of course, affiliate links don't tell you if you're getting any KU borrows. So what my spreadsheet does is it says, okay, we sort of just assume that if on average you you have a certain number of borrows, ads are probably going to be about the same. I mean, it's, it's a rough assumption, but it's it's the best we can make. So the spreadsheet will then actually work out what percentage. So every time you make a sale, um, it'll say, okay, every time you make a sale, you you um, have 0.8 KU borrows. Or for some people, you might have like 1.1 KU borrows. I actually I actually have more KU borrows than I have sales based on my read through. Um, and then it, it does it basically then gives you this breakdown of what your read through is for KU and for sales at the end. At the end, it says, okay, here's your profit for every single sale of book one. You even you actually you even put in your number of pages and the delivery costs and everything, because um, because obviously if you're running seventy percent Amazon charges you a delivery cost for each for each book. So it'll actually tell you for every single sale of book one you are going to make this much money. And for me, it's actually twenty one dollars. Um, every time I sell the first book in my series, I will I will make twenty one dollars. And that's with people dropping off and, and not reading the whole series. So then the next thing that that um, and this is this is um, both in the book that I have and also if you go into the files section. Um, on the 20 books to 50K group, I actually have um, my initial four posts put into a PDF and I describe how to do all this. I tell you, I basically walk you through the math of how to say, okay, if you have this cost per click on Facebook and you have this many sales per click, uh, here's what your break even is. And so, so what it does, and I won't get into the details right now because describing math doesn't barely works for me, let alone anyone else, is it basically says if your cost per click is over this or you're not, or you're only getting this many sales per click, you're losing money. Anything better than this, you're making money. So that's a pretty a pretty important thing because what you can then do is you can look at your Facebook ads and say, anytime that my cost per click goes over thirty five cents per click, that's just just a number I'm throwing out there. I'm now losing money, and you can and you know that you know when to kill ads, you know when to tweak ads or anything like that. Whereas without that, you're like, I have no idea if thirty five cents losing money doesn't sound that bad. I'll let it keep going, you know, or something like that. Or if you get an ad that um, is it's a lower cost per click, say it's only 10, 10 costs. Uh, 10 cents per click, but some of the other numbers don't look so good. You can say, well, you know what? Even at 10 cents a click, even if only one in 50 people that clicks this is buying, I'm actually still making money, um, which is normally you would think, wow, I, I had 50 clicks and I made one sale. That must be the worst ad ever. But for me, um, like I said, I make $21 per sale. So if I have 50 clicks at, um, at 10 cents a click, I still made $15, $16 off of, off of, uh, off of that ad. Um, and, and that's a good thing to know. It's good to understand those numbers. Otherwise, you can kill perfectly good ads and, um, and you know, hurt yourself by doing that. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the things that seems about this is that it uh, seems like a lot of this information is for, like, very long running ads. Like, you're saying how you've had an ad running for a super long time and you don't want to even edit it because it loses history. Can you sort of still get benefit from a shorter run ad, like, say, say campaigns during a launch or, a, or as you said, a sale? Well, the, the thing about Facebook is that um, Facebook isn't, like I said, they're not going to tell you if your ad is any good or not until you've had 500 impressions. So if you're going to run um, an ad for a launch, you'll actually need to start that ad a couple days early to see if that ad's any good or not. And if it's not, then you might have to run another one to see if it's any good or not. And, and I guess in theory, as you get better at this, you, you get less duds. Although, I mean, I still have duds every now and then where I, I make an ad and it just, it just sucks and no one cares. Um, so. They're, they're okay for shorter runs. Like I have some ads I only run for a couple of weeks here and there. Um, but by the same token, they, they don't take off running immediately. Uh, Facebook will always charges you more at the very beginning of an ad unless it's you know a, a brilliant ad. Um, so you, you might, if you're running a launch, you'd have to actually kick off that ad even before the launch and then it run for maybe let, let run for a couple of weeks after. If I'm doing like a, a full week long countdown deal or something like that, I will oftentimes run ads for it though. Um, so, and a lot of times I'll start the ad like even a week ahead of time, and the ad just doesn't mention price. That is relevant before and after the the sale. You mentioned uh, before on some of the notes that you sent to us that you know you have got some interesting things you do to keep your book selling. Care to share? Um, well, I guess one of them is is running ads, um, and the other thing is that like I, I see a lot of authors. And they, you know, you'll, they'll, they'll be in some group and like, oh man, sales just dropped off for me. I hit the cliff, you know, I'm not selling anything or whatnot. And, and I'll, usually I'll pop in and say, well, what's your, what's your current promotion that you're running right now? And they're like, well, I'm not running a promotion. I only run promotions when I do launches. And I'm like, well, you know, there are 1 million other authors out there. And at any given time, some of them are running promotions. There's only so many readers and there's only so many top slots out there right now. So if you're not running a promo, someone else is. And, and they're going to be the one that's getting the reader's attention right now. So it's a lot of it is um, I'm always working on running it, run, running newsletter swaps. I probably swap with um, maybe 
10 people a month right now. Um, I'm always working, I'm always like scheduling deals in uh, things like, and I, I try to find the ones that aren't too expensive, like um, Authors XP or Your New Books or something like that. I'm always running ads in those those different things. Uh, like next month, I think I'm, I think I have 45 promos running in different different sites like that. I mean, I would recommend everybody does that sort of thing. Obviously, I'm I'm trying to sell a lot of books at a, at a high volume, but I'm even before that, I was always running these things. And like I said, the main reason is that um, I, I always want to be in people's consciousness. Uh, one of the sort of the old axioms from from advertising from the days of yore is that someone has to see your product five times before they buy. Um, whether or not that's exactly true or not with books, I don't know, but I'd, I'd be surprised if it was always if it was always one, you know. So I know every time I'm, even if I'm running like a promo in a newsletter or whatnot, people are going to see my name. They're going to see it again. They're going to see it again. And after a while, they're going to say, well, there must be something with something with this guy because he's, you know, able to still be around. <laughs> so he must, he must be doing all right and they'll, they'll check it out. Whereas if they see me, you know, like say, for example, I'm, I'm a writer who can't go full time um, and I'm only putting out two, maybe three books a year or less. And I only promo when I release, you're completely out of people's consciousness every single day between all these releases. And, um, and ads is one way to keep that, keep that ball rolling. But another way is these promo sites. I do think actually the number one way to, to get your, your book in front of readers is, is swapping with other authors. Author newsletters are still the most valuable way to, uh, to get in front of other readers. And you want to be smart about, like we talked about at the very beginning, uh, for whatever reason, Lindsay and I will sell a lot of books and we have no crossover between our readers. Um, about 40% of my readers are female, and somehow I've not encountered uh, any significant number of Lindsay authors. So I, I do this sort of thing actually from time to time. Um, I'll, I'll go and look at other authors that are high on the charts in categories or, that, I, that I sell them and look to see if I'm in their also, also bots. And if I'm not, those are the people I target to try and to reach out to them and, and say, hey, do you want to do a swap or something like that? Or, or try to you know get them maybe to mention me to their readers or something like that, because those are people that have, that have, in theory, not encountered my books at all. Or if they have, they didn't like them, but maybe a trusted author's recommendation would uh, would get them to pick them up. That's definitely a damn good idea. Nice. Yeah. And you'll see Michael and I running a newsletter promo together next month. Snag <laughs> 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 each other's readers. <laughs> I'm actually along those lines. I'm doing this crazy thing. September 24th. I'm putting all of my books at 99 cents. All right. Well, so let me ask you, uh, you mentioned you're a KU fan and there's nothing wrong with that. Like I said, all my pen name stuff is in there and it's treating the pen name well. But we did have a Twitter question from Dale who was wondering if you've used Facebook ads for books in other stores and if you have any recommendations for people who are wide. I've, I've not done too much wide. Um, I'm one of those authors that and I don't understand the KU magic. Some people, they just do great with KU. And some people they put their books up there and just no one in KU bites. And I, it's 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 almost it's almost like there's like a, a magical KU fairy that just some, seems to pick some people. But I make sixty percent of my revenue from from KU, so, so um, it's it's very you know just the thought of pulling all losing all that revenue and going off and and trying trying wide is pretty terrifying. Although I do plan on doing it probably the next um, six months just because I want to. Uh, I don't like the fact that all my eggs are in one basket is what it comes down to. Um, the tricky thing with with uh, ads is that. And just for Amazon, I can actually target people that um, read on the Kindle. In fact, one of the things that I, I describe in my book, and it's also in the, the, the PDF you can grab, is when you first create your audience, you like pick a bunch of authors and stuff like that. And then in, and once you've created an audience, this little link appears down underneath, and it's a little blue text that says narrow audience. And you click that, and then you can say, um, everybody who's read these, who, who's interested in these things, and who is also interested in these things. Because inside the, when you build an audience, you're like picking a bunch of authors like Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke, and you're picking, you know, Mike, actually I can't pick Michael Landerly, which kills me. One day he'll be in there and I can pick Michael Landerly. Um, you pick all these different authors. It's an or selection. So people are interested in this author or this author or this author or hard science fiction or whatever. But when you click that little narrow audience thing, you can then add in people who are, who have to be anded into the equation. They're interested in these things and they're interested in these things. And the thing I pick is Amazon Kindle. Um, <clears throat> so I know that every single person that I'm marketing for has expressed at least some interest in Amazon Kindle. And I'm not going to get a lot of people showing up my ad saying, oh, well, that sucks. That's not Nook because I only read on Nook or something like that. I'm not wasting my money. Um, if you're in multiple stores, you have a couple of options. Uh, one of them is to use, um, you know, use something like Smart URL it or to use Draft to Digital's universal links. Uh, Drafts to Digital's Universal Links may be the best thing because what what they do is you don't have to you don't have to actually publish with D2D to use them. It's a separate service they have. You put all your links into their system, 
and then someone comes to, the, to your to your draft a digital universal link, and then it says it says the word you read, and they're like, oh, well, I always read on iTunes. And every single time that person ever comes to a draft a digital universal link afterward, it just sends the draft to iTunes, and they have to pick. So that can make it a little bit easier because every single stop along the way is bad. Um, it, you'll lose people every single stop. In fact, I recommend, for example, don't link your ads to your site and then let you have to force people to click off to Amazon because they won't. Um, the Amazon product page is like the most focused selling page in existence. You want to get people there as soon as humanly possible. Um, so there, so that would be the best thing I think for going wide is using something like Draft and Digital's Universal Links. Um, there are other services that offer that. Like I think Smart URL it was doing something like that, similar to similar to that as well. Um, and the the other thing you could do is is you could run ads for each store. So you could run, um, and I've actually had some people do this with, with some success and some people that didn't work out as well for them. But you, when you narrow that audience thing, you could actually make an ad that's focused on Amazon and you can make another ad that's focused on iTunes or something like that. And you could even put different text in or something like that. Cause you think, okay, the iTunes demographic maybe is different. Maybe they're, you know, they're more upscale they they have a little more money. You could, you know, depending on the type of product you're selling, you could, you could, uh, tweak it that way as well. Um, and along those lines, the other thing I do as well is I run different ads for different countries. I don't select multiple countries in my ads. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, what people oftentimes forget is that there are 330 million people in the United States, and then Canada, Australia, and um, United Kingdom are the size of the West Coast population-wise. If you can put them all together, <laughs> so it's so you actually can't run as many ads focused on those people. So I break my ads up because I actually turn my ads off every now and then for those different countries because I don't want to saturate them constantly seeing my stuff all the time. But in the U.S., there's enough readers that I don't have to do that. So. All right, so cool. And it's I think Books to Read is the name of the site that uh, Draft to Digital runs for the link thing. We've had them on here before and okay, cool. talked about it. Yeah, I've never actually used it. I just I just heard yeah. them talking about it one time. And it, it works well. I've I've done that like on Twitter cool. where you only have room for one little link to share. You know, like here's your Books to Read link. Absolutely, yeah. And I believe you can also target like the Apple iOS specifically. So you would only get people oh, nice. who are surfing on the Mac or their iPad or whatever. Right. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense too. Yeah. Not that um, I've, I've actually, tried it, but not had much luck. But I'm going to try it again now. I'm, I'm excited here to <laughs> to jump cool. in again. All right. So another, another side note, just while I'm thinking about it, is recently Amazon affiliates released a thing called One Link. So if you if you use Amazon affiliate links, I recommend you go look at that. They'll have a couple of things. It's, I think it's underneath their tools thing, where they will now actually using affiliate links send people to the right country store, which is nice as well, because um, that can be a problem too if you're running an ad. And you might want to say, say for example, you, you do want to run an ad for the US, UK, and Australia. Well, you can only put one link in there and it goes to the US store. So Amazon now has a thing called one link that will um, send people to the right store and keep your affiliate tracking and money. Yeah, that would be great. Because I, I whenever, even when I just post on Facebook, if I don't put like all the stores, people are like, I can't find it in my store. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, just like, search for my name. URL. It's, it's yeah. there. But yeah, they want the instant right to their country. Which is understandable. Yeah. I do too. Yep. Um, I did have a question earlier. You were talking about narrowing the audience down by like uh, selecting authors that you're similar to, and uh, I've actually struggled with this with my pen name because there are no trad published authors that write science fiction romance. Basically, it's kind of a mm -hmm. little niche that they don't touch. So there's very few names that will actually come up. If like I try typing in names, but they're not mm -hmm. big enough presence on Facebook to target. Yep. Do you have any suggestions for people like that, or in this little cool. niches and and not really similar to a lot of big authors? So the, the there's actually that's a really there's two parts of this that are really interesting. One is if you're say you're running an ad and, and certain genres are especially bad for this, like romance or um, urban fantasy is really hard to find um, the right authors because they're not on Facebook, you know, or their their Facebook doesn't list them as a as an audience you can select. Um, the other thing, the, so first thing is that everybody else is also picking all of those top authors, so your cost per click is going to be higher. So it's a sort of a quick segue. The way that Paying for ads works with 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 uh, what's called it's actually bidding that you're doing. You're bidding for a spot. Is everybody is all these people standing around? They've all got a bunch of money, and Amazon looks at them all and said, "Who has the most money to 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 um, to show this ad?" And they actually will do that. They'll say, "Okay, here's all these different people who want to advertise for this keyword, and whoever has the most money um, is going to be the ad that we're going to show." And they they and then of course they gauge in whether or not your ad sucks or not, and they'll show ones that don't suck more or whatnot. But but you're basically bidding. Every single time, whoever's willing to bid more money is going to be the one that um, that gets the ad shown. This is more obvious if you look at AMS ads. So if you're picking the authors that everybody else is picking, 
it's a bidding war. The more people bidding, the higher the price goes. So um, I recommend don't pick the top authors. Don't go to page one um, on, on your subgenre and look at those authors. Go to page two, go to page five and look at those guys. And the other big thing is go to the golden era for whatever your genre is. So um, for you, Lindsay, I'd say you should be advertising the heck out of Anne McCaffrey and Elizabeth Moon. Um, Cause they wrote, uh, Anne McCaffrey especially wrote lots and lots. I mean, basically everything that she wrote was SFR. Um, she tricked us all into reading romance is what I always say. I had no idea I was reading romance. I looked and like, there's just girls on the covers of all these books. I'm reading romance. I liked it, so I kept doing it. Um, she's my, still my favorite author of all time. But, um, but yeah, I actually advertise for Anne McCaffrey a lot for, for my books, and I do really well. And I've actually worked with a couple of other um, SFR authors, and they went and they looked at sort of the, the golden era female authors who, who had a lot of romantic elements in their books. And sure enough, there's a lot of women who have disposable income who are happy to, you know, to start to read books that are advertised for those same people. I do the same thing for my science fiction. I pick Heinlein and um, Arthur C. Clarke. Um, I focus on, uh, on, you know, I'll advertise using Starship Troopers and stuff like that. I, I go for all the golden era stuff because it's less money and there's tons of people out there who, you know, they, they're, they're interested in that stuff. All right. So uh, obviously we're talking a lot about Facebook and, and you need to sort of be on Facebook to make, you know, the use of Facebook ads and whatnot. So uh, is there like, let's say, for example, like I have a Facebook fan page. Is there any mm -hmm. value at all in trying to recruit followers to your fan page? Don't do it. Um, there are a lot of people out there who, well, one, people just click like on everything if you if you try to get them to do it. Um, and the other thing is that there have been enough people that have done tests and they've proven that if you run campaigns on Facebook to get likes, Facebook will show that just to everybody because they want to spend your money. Um, and, you, and there's actually people who run click farms who specifically try and, and target all those things as well to make their click farms look more reasonable. Um, and all you end up doing is you end up building an audience of people that aren't really that useful to you. Um, so I would I would high, uh, strongly recommend against that. Um, the thing that I, and it, the thing that I recommend you should do is one, um, if you're going to run ads, don't run them from your author page. Um, so there's there's a number of things that I don't know if you guys have ever noticed. Like so, you've, a lot of people have author pages, and it's it's like a business page, and you also maybe have a fan page, and you might post something in your author page and say and say all things are equal. Your author page has a thousand people following it. And your fan your your random fan page, which is just like a group page, has a thousand people following it. You'll post the same thing on both of them, and you'll get two to three times the engagement on the fan page. Facebook shows things from business pages less um, because it doesn't want to look like a big business site. It wants to look like pictures of cats and dogs and cheeseburgers. Um, so, so what I recommend people do, and this is this is my my super secret sauce, so you guys will all be, be very happy that I do this, is I run all of my ads from uh, ubiquitous pages that look like they have nothing to do with me. Um, and I'm tapping into a couple of things there. Uh, one, I'm tapping into sort of the trusted third party thing. Um, it's, it's kind of funny. So as authors, as indie authors, and this was the hardest thing to get over, um, I have to shill myself all the time. I'm constantly out there pimping my name. And when I first started doing it, I'm like, this is so distasteful. I, I can't bear the thought of being out there constantly selling myself and talking myself up and whatnot. And after a while, you get used to it. Um, and you sort of just do it. But the thing you forget is that it's actually still distasteful. <laughs> Everybody else still sees it the same way as well when you're out there shilling yourself all the time. But you don't notice it anymore because it's all that you do all the time. Um, but people have this sort of innate thing where they'll trust a third party more than they trust you to recommend a thing. Um, so I have a bunch of different pages. They're all genre specific and they're all, um, this is not one that I run. For example, if you're running urban fantasy, you could say you have the Buffy and Supernatural fan page or something like that. Um, and you would actually run all your ads as those pages because you don't have to run them as your author page. You can run them as any, as any um, fan page or any group that you run. And that's what I run all of my ads as. They're all running underneath these other pages that are sort of genre fan pages. Um, and the other neat thing too is that some of them now have three or 4,000 followers. And I will also use those to promote other authors too. Because what I want to do is I have these, these pages, I, I actually want them to be, to be trusted uh, recommenders for, for people that like them of, of books and deals and whatnot. So whenever I see an author that I like that I think has good books and whatnot, I'll, I'll constantly promote sales and deals on these pages and whatnot. And my promotions on these pages, on the pages themselves, are less than 10% of what goes on them, onto, onto them. Like 90% of it's other author stuff that are running deals and whatnot. And then when I run my ads, I, I run them as that page as well. And then all these people that are used to seeing good content from this particular page see this ad and they're like, hey, I like that stuff he has. I'll go check out this book. Um, so that's that's kind of the best way to manage that. You've gone on record as stating rank doesn't matter, nor do categories for that matter. <clears throat> so <laughs> could you tell us what you what your reasoning is for that? I've gotten into so many fun arguments about this sort of thing. Um, 
So there's a lot of authors, they, they, and I did this too. I did this excessively. I don't even look at my ranks most of the time anymore. Um, they, they think that the rank sells books. And, and to a small extent, it does in, in Facebook's promotional al algorithms. Um, but really, rank, rank is an indicator of books sold. Um, and you can see this, for example, uh, recently there was that, those, those big spates that went on of people that somehow managed to find the right click farm, the click farms that would actually do borrows. Um, and these click farms would actually like borrow your book all the way up to like number two or three in the entire Amazon store. And you'd see these people would have books that'd be like, you know, 60, 80, 100,000 would be their rank. The next day, their rank is three. Four days later, their rank is 60, 80, 100,000 because rank doesn't sell books. Um, rank is just an indicator of books sold. And, and yes, if the right people see it and it starts to get starts to get traction, it could become sticky or something like that. But the rank itself is nothing that will sell books. And people are constantly, they're focused like, oh, I got to get my rank up. I got to get my rank up. You're on a hamster wheel that's going to kill you. Because um, what you're basically trying to do is you're trying to get the almighty Amazon God to show you some favor for a little bit longer. Um, and that favor can evaporate at any time. And you see it when people hit the cliffs. Um, they say that favor evaporates and they're like, I had a rank of like, you know, 4,000. Now I have a rank of 15,000. What's going on? And and there's a whole bunch of things that are going on. But the thing that really comes, comes down to is that, that your rank wasn't selling books. It was all these other activities that were selling books. And the way that Amazon averages your rank out over time um, made it look like it was beneficial. So I, I, I tell people, um, and there's this caveat that yes, Amazon does favor books that are ranked well and that are ranked well for a long period of time, but they, they really favor those books because they're selling and Amazon wants to promote things that sell. In fact, Amazon actually cares about the conversion of your product page. People will come to your product page and they never buy, then Amazon stops showing that product page in search results. But if people come to your product page and they buy, Amazon will show up more in search results. Um, and then it, all, all of that feeds into rank. Um, so what I always say is I say, be the master of your own destiny. You drive the activities that create the sales and then get you rank. And if Amazon then, um, or if Amazon then starts to show your book more search results, it's as a result of the activities that you did. Um, you know, don't wait for the lottery to do this sort of thing. And I, I have um, series now that have been around for, you know, that, that, that hit, really, hit it really big last fall. And I maintain those series completely on, on Facebook ads now and other marketing activities. If I stop doing that stuff, they sell zero. But, but the work that I do, I can actually make a living off of off of those those books and some of them now have ranks in like seven eight thousand um you know which which you know, when you're when you when i had a book for for example that lived in the top 1000 for four months um so after that you're like wow my book went for the top 1000 to four months for four months and now it's like eight thousand but the funny thing is like i still make a living off of it um uh, because i've got i have enough books in the series now and whatnot that i can do that and I'm the master of my own destiny you know when i advertise more i sell more and i make more money versus just sort of you know, praying that Amazon is going to favor me. And what your take on reviews? Does that help or just completely frivolous? Um, I think it helps, but every now and then I see these authors that have horrible reviews. I'm just like, I have no idea how this book sells with these reviews. Um, I do read the comments on my reviews. And actually, I comment on a lot of my reviews. I'm like that author out there that is like, why does he do these things? They're all the things you're not supposed to do. But I, I don't do it quite as much as I used to, but there was a, for a while I would reply to almost all my one star reviews. Um, and I would, and I was always very, I, I actually sold books based on that. Like I had this one, one star review where I said, you know, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to give me this review. Um, here's my thoughts on why I did it this way. I'd be interested in knowing more from you. Um, and everybody said, wow, you were so nice in this response. I'm going to buy your book just for it. I think there's actually like four or five comments after that one saying that they, they bought my book because of my response to the review. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I know that people read reviews and they care about the comments on the reviews because I, I see them and I see people replying to my comments. And there's actually some of my reviews that have, con that have conversation threads going on on them. Um, so I know, I know that if the reviews all sucked, there would certainly be some people that, that wouldn't buy the books. Whether or not it's a massive percentage, I don't know. Um, I think probably so long as you have four and a half stars colored in, no one really goes and looks at the reviews too much. But if, you, if you're at four stars, then, then I think it does start to matter more. I think a lot of people then start to look at your negative reviews and see what's wrong. Yeah, I've actually done that. I, I, I still don't do it now, but I did it before where if I get like a one-star review, it's like, okay, you, you thought I used too much expletives. Okay, well, thanks for giving it a try. Thank you and have a good day. And, and I have people yeah. respond like, oh, that was a surprisingly nice reaction. I'll give your second book a try. I'm like, that, you know what? If you don't like the first, don't try the second. <laughs> it's written the same way. But it's true. Whatever. Sometimes you're like, you have to get these bad reviews on like your third or fourth book. Like, why are you so, please stop reading my books? <laughs> I had this one guy who actually went, he read a whole bunch of my books and then he, he hit this point where he got sick of me and he just one starred everything after that. That was, he's, thank, thank God he stopped doing it because he would like be like my first review on every book too. Um, it was fantastic. Um, 
And I actually was really tempted at one point to put this little thing here, <laughs> like my forward saying, this one's for you, buddy. You know, I was going to name in my book as my Let's Start Reviewer. But luckily, wiser heads prevailed. They came my wife, and I never did that. <laughs> he went away on his own. I guess it's the whole don't feed the trolls thing I should have been listening to. That's when you but, just accidentally I, name a bad guy that gets killed horribly. Just happen yeah. to have the same first name. No, no biggie. <laughs> no biggie. But uh, I, like, so I do, so I do think reviews matter. Um, I think people, you know, as humans, we all get fixated too much on the negative reviews. Um, actually, there was a conversation today in this one thread where someone said, I don't read my reviews because half the time they're just nonsense, which is true. Half the time they are just nonsense. The thing that sucks, too, is the five stars are the ones that usually give you the least information. They're like, it was a great book. And you're like, what did you like about it? I want to do more of the things you like, but you didn't say anything. The people that hate your book will tell you all the reasons why they hate your book. Um, but what I did suggest to someone, as I said, you know, read the one stars to see if you're screwing anything up. But afterwards, click that five star link and read some of the five star reviews. So you can like dig yourself out of that hole you're probably in. Read reviews before I write, though. Like I'm not gonna do it in the morning before I start writing, because I'll just kill your muse for the day. Yeah, that's tough if you're at all sensitive, and a lot of us are, you know, like you can get 10 great reviews and that one is <laughs> the one that yeah. sticks in your mind and makes you doubt everything you're doing with your yeah. <laughs> yourself. Yeah, I, had, I have a, an anthology I put out called the Pew Pew Anthology. Um, well, we've got one so far, we have seven more planned. Um, and so I wrote an A-team, um, so it's, it's, in the, it's in the future. So it's a space opera A-team, it's all women. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's crazy and they're all doing all sorts of crazy things and um and it's, it's it's violent and has lots of bad language and stuff like that too because it's like i thought the 18 would really be if, you know if it wasn't you know made in the 80s on tv and almost every one star in in the uh, for the anthology is because of my story so when i went to write the story for the second one i made the mistake of reading the reviews that day and then i wasn't able to write anything for a couple of days um yeah, it can be tough. Um, we had a couple questions in the chat. Uh, Benjamin and a couple others were wondering, you'd mentioned Facebook groups and pages kind of in the same breath. And I think what you mean is to make a page, like a business page called like Book Dragon or something, if you're a fantasy, and then do what you were talking about where you're promoting other authors and yourself. Or did you actually mean make a Facebook group where you have to kind of invite people in or accept their request to join? Sorry, yeah, there, there's actually a bunch of nuances there. So what most of us have is we have a, a business page, which is our author page. But you can also make things called fan pages, which are, are actually not the same thing as groups. Because um, actually, I, that was a mis I misspoke. You can't create ads for groups. So for example, if you, like, for example, the, the, the 20 books to 50K group, you can't run an ad, it's 20 books to 50K. But there is, a, there is like a fan page option when you're creating a new group that you can pick. And you can run ads as those. And, and they don't show up. Um, they, they will shop more than uh, stuff posted in like a, a business page. Um, I don't know why. It's just, I guess, what Facebook wants to do. I'll, I'll see if I can dig up the information on that. Maybe share it in the show notes. Yeah, that's good to know. For those of us, it's been five years since we made our page. I vaguely remember having to pick like, are you a band or are you a business or what are you? Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, I, I also had somebody wondering, uh, Lee on Twitter, it, it kind of sounds like you're basically sending people to buy your book on Amazon. Have you done any ads where you're like giving away a free book if they sign up kind of to build your mailing list? I don't believe in giving away free books, so no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's, that's the short and unhelpful answer. No, I, I actually have a more helpful answer. Um, because I've, I've run ads for a lot of authors who, um, I shouldn't say a lot, a couple of authors. Every now and then I, I help people out, but I, I don't do it very much. So um, I'm not actually trying to shell a business or anything. But I've, I've run ads for authors who were doing series with a, with a perma-free book one. And it can work. Um, you actually have to, if you mention that the book is free um, in your ad, you'll get lots of activity on it. But what we found is that um, basically the whole goal in running, a, running an ad is you want read through. Um, you want to get people to go through your whole series because you don't make any money off of anything that's free. In fact, you just spend money on it. So if you're going to, um, we, we actually found that people made more money if the book was 99 cents than if the book was free because everything people's to read piles for their free stuff is a very different to read pile than, than stuff they paid for. So um, a 99 cent book actually made people sometimes like three or four times more money than if the book was free. Um, even though the, the sheer volume of downloads they got was different. The other interesting thing too is that every time someone clicks that, then you pay. And if it's free, you're paying for all those clicks, and you're not getting anything. But if, so if, it's, if it costs money, or if it doesn't say it's free, you'll get fewer clicks. But the people that do click and buy are, are or, sorry, who do click are more likely to buy because they're in a mindset that they might have to pay for the thing they're looking at versus getting it for free. 
that if that makes sense. No, I, I like that. And that's, I like that philosophy because I, I guess I've run into quite a few people now who have used Facebook ads to build a mailing list by giving away free books. And they're like, I've got 30,000 people on my mailing list. And you look at their book rankings and you're like, I don't think those yeah. people were buying your books at all. Yeah. So I don't know how. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You spend actually, a lot of money um, for, for that. <laughs> Yeah, so it is a lot of money, specifically from the mailing list perspective. Um, I've got a portion of my book where I talk about, I say, don't use Facebook ads to build your mailing list. And I work that out. I say, okay, you're going to pay, say you're going to pay 30 cents per click. Um, say one in five people to click signs up. That means that you just paid a buck 50 per email address. That's a pretty expensive email address when then you have to now put it into MailChimp or something like that, pay to keep it there, mail them a whole bunch of times and sort of pray that eventually they'll buy something. And I, I worked out a bunch of the math on it. I said, you're probably going to spend five or six bucks um, to make a sale. And actually it was a lot more than that. Actually, I think it works up to $15 to make a sale typically. Whereas if you were to do in a multi, go to multi-author promo, um, for example, I did one with, uh, Kevin McLaughlin. That was, was really good. No, usually they aren't quite this good. Um, I think I spent $50 and I got 3000 email addresses and they were good email addresses. They were people that were genre specific and they were engaged and they were interested in whatnot. And I think that worked out to, um, to, I might have the numbers wrong, but I remember it being, it was less than five cents an email address. Um, and like I said, if you were to try and advertise, thirty cents per click, five of them sign up. You're paying a buck fifty per email address. So I was I was spending I was paying fifteen times less for each email address, and they were you know people that were actually interested in reading my genre. Yeah, that's a good point too. That you're not only paying for the Facebook ads, but then if you have thirty thousand people on your list, it's costing you hundreds of dollars a month just to yeah. have a list that size. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's expensive. Expensive list to keep floating around. Uh, one more question from a viewer, Kirk, uh, for Facebook ads that are being driven directly to an Amazon page, what is considered a good click to sale ratio? So it, it'll depend on your price. Um, first off, if your book is 99 cents, you're going to see a lot more people buying that book than if your book is 399, 499. Um, what I say to people is that you need, you should be, you should expect to get about a sale for every 10 clicks. Um, and well, actually so it's, a sale for every 10 is actually pretty good. So if you're getting a sale for every 10, you're doing well. If you're getting a sale for every 30, then you're starting to be in trouble. And a lot of it depends how much you can tolerate. And that gets back to like I was saying, if I have um, if I have a five book series and my read through is good enough that say I make $20 every single time someone buys book one, um, then I would then I would look at it and say, that'd be kind of high. Say I make $10 every time someone buys, buys book one. Then I could look at it and say, okay, if I make $10 every time someone, someone buys book one, I'm paying 30 cents per click. Um, and I'm going to script the math here, so I'm not going to try and do it, but you can just basically do the math. You can divide the numbers and say, okay, I need to make a sale every X number of clicks to make money. Um, and, and that's, that, that math is in the, the PDF I have and it's in the book as well. Um, and that's really the main thing is like, are you making money or not? Um, uh, but, but I would say a good, a good threshold would be 30. If you, if you, if you have 30 clicks, and you didn't sell a book, then, then the ad probably isn't working that well for you. And if you have, if you get uh, 10 clicks and you sell a book then the ad's working very well. All right. Um, so I actually, have, this is something I've, I've tinkered with, and I wonder if you have any uh, feelings on it. Speaking of mailing lists and uh, Facebook ads, I know there's a way to build, I think it's called a lookalike list or whatever, uh, audience where you export mm -hmm. your mailing list and then import it to, to Facebook. Have you had any experience mm -hmm. with that? Is it worth doing? Um, I've actually had horrible luck doing lookalike audiences off of mailing lists. Um, I don't, you'd expect that they would be the best things. But every time I run, I do one, and I've, I've helped other authors do them as well. Sometimes mailing lists of even like 20, 30,000 people, the ads just cost tons of money. You'll take the exact same ad and you'll do with one of these lookalike audiences built off a mailing list and you'll pay like 80 cents a click. And then you'll take, you'll take, you'll build a new audience that is, um, you know, just a bunch of author names and you'll pay 20 cents a click. And I've never had the mailing list one perform better, um, which you, like I said, you'd expect the other, be the other way around. I think the reason why is, is purely the size. Um, when I build most of my audiences on Facebook, I usually end up with a couple million people in that audience. And then I narrow it down to people who are interested in Amazon Kindle and it usually drops down to maybe 100,000. But the thing to think about is that basically Facebook wants to spend your money. That's all they really care about in this particular, well, I mean, they care about looking relevant, but they really care about spending your money. Um, so if, if you have an audience of 100 people and, and Facebook is charging you per click and these 100 people aren't clicking, Facebook is going to charge you more and more money. Like so, for, like, so if you have like a thousand people clicking, Facebook's like, oh yeah, I just show this ad, and you know, a thousand people click, and I get all of Michael's money. But if I only have a hundred people that this ad's visible to, and I'm willing to spend the same amount of money, Facebook's like, oh man, you know, only four of these guys are ever going to click on the stupid ad that Michael made. So it's going to charge me like two fifty a click. 
or something like that because it's, it's just comes down to the math how big the audience is how much money you have they'll charge you the smaller the audience the more they charge you to click um and for whatever reason the the, the ones that seem to come off mailing lists are always really small all right let's see so for my for my final question i'm actually going to make it to one of our viewer questions from and i hope i pronounce her name right erin lay she says if releasing the first three books in a series close together how would you use facebook ads as a launch strategy as a, it looks like she says she has a military sci-fi slash space opera genre mm -hmm. um so i hope you're doing pre-orders between each book for starters um, I'm, a, I'm a huge pre-order advocate. I, I believe that every book should have a link to the next book in the back of it. Um, and I care about that more than I care about rank. Actually, that's sort of part of the rank thing. Is I'd rather people give me money now than everybody, a whole bunch of people give me money on a particular day and lose my rank. Um, but yeah, what I would probably do is I wouldn't run ads um, until maybe a day or so before book one comes out. And I would do a day or so before because I would want to make sure the ad is good. Um, and I would, just, I would just push that book one really hard and just sort of count on the read through to keep going. Um, advertising for anything other than book one is typically not, you know, something that ends up working out that well because you get people to click and they're like, ah, oh, it's book two and they don't bother to scroll down and realize they can just go over to book one. It's surprising how many people don't seem to realize there's a, a series navigator on, on pages. Um, I would also, I mean, a lot of this depends on whether or not you have a big, a big fan page. I do, I do do boosted posts for, um, for releases. That's the only time I do boosted posts, um, mainly because I'm trying to communicate with specifically with a group of people that already follow me to say, hey, you guys are interested in me, you follow me, here's this thing that's out. Um, boosted posts have, have very bad engagement if you're going to try and use them for finding new people. So um, so I would I would do that for part of my Facebook strategy. And um, I think one of the things I would do is when I'm, when I'm running the ad for book one, one of the things that you know, we want is we want the people that love reading series. If, if you're a series writer, I should say, you want people that that love reading series. series. I wish there was a proper plural word for series. Um, just want to throw that out there. I'm always writing series and I know it's wrong. I'm like, there's probably some word out there that everybody else knows and they're laughing at me for, um, for not knowing. But yeah, what I would do is I would probably mention somewhere in the ad, maybe down the, the bottom copy area, which is called like the news feed description. I would say something like, you know, book one of the three book series, you know, or something like that, just so they know that it's, it's, um, it's not the first book in a series. Actually, I, I recommend doing that in general is mentioning, um, if you have, uh, if you have, if it's, a, if it's a longer series, it's a good thing to mention it in your ad because longer series people want, they want to read a longer series. So All right, good deal. The best I got. <laughs> that sounds good for me. All right, uh, let me hand you back over to Lindsay. We'll see if we can wrap this up for you. All right, cool. Uh, just one of the things on the lookalike audiences. <laughs> I think, you know, I actually went in and looked at like the CV, whatever you call it, the, the spreadsheet that you can export and the fields are like where they're from, their age group, their sex. Mm -hmm. There's never the thing like science fiction romance lover. There's not like a column for that. So I really don't know. I think maybe that's part of why it's not effective because it's basing on demographics versus yeah, that's passions. Which, yeah, you don't really know. Like, does this mean that they own a house, went to college, you know? And yeah. some of those things may apply when it comes down to disposable income and whatnot, but not so much when you're selling books. You know, we're not selling, you know, things that require college education type of uh, income to buy. Um, so yeah, you're right. A lot of them probably don't work that well. All right. My last question is just how much are you monitoring your ads to make sure that the ratio, click-through ratios don't creep up or you're not spending too much money every day? Are you in there every day or do you find that there's a point at which you can kind of set it and forget it on an ad? So there's, there's um, they don't do. And that thing that they say don't do is they say don't fiddle with your ad spend all the time. Um, I fiddle with my ad spend every single day. Um, on almost all of my ads. And so because of that, I'm, I'm in there doing it. There, so the reason why people say don't fiddle with your ad, they're sorry, they're, mainly when they say don't fiddle with your ad spend, they don't, they mean don't keep increasing it over, over, over every single day and don't increase by large amounts. Um, actually, that's a really good piece of advice I should throw out there. Always start your ads at $5 a day and only increase that spend when the ad is performing well. Um, never start an ad at $50 a day. Facebook will just eat all that money and you'll end up with like seven clicks or something like that. Um, which is probably where a lot of people do lose money. They're they jump a whole bunch of money into Facebook ads really fast, and, and Facebook just nom nom noms it all. And they have no money. Um, the reason why you why people typically tell you not to tweak with your Facebook ad spend is because on, on every single ad, there's a little thing that says frequency, and it shows basically the frequency is how many times in in a given time frame it's shown that ad to someone. So if you're in the upper right hand corner of Facebook, which I think is maybe not the right hand for you guys are looking. I don't know if I'm reversed or not. Um, you can select your time frame, like if you're looking at this week or this month or today or something like that. And if you're, say, looking at this week 
and you realize, shoot, I'm looking at this week and my frequency is like four. That means people are seeing your ad over and over and over again. Um, and if you were to increase your spend, Facebook is going to show your ad to the same people over and over and over again, which of course means your effectiveness for that ad is going to go down. So that's typically why people say increase your money slowly, don't tweak, don't fiddle with your ads a lot. And um, <clears throat> and uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought all of a sudden there. Yeah, don't don't play with your ads a lot because people might just jack their ad up and start spending more money than the audience they've selected can support. So so that's why they don't say it. But what I found is that if I take my ads and I increase them by about 15% at six o'clock every night, Facebook wants to spend my money and they're gonna spend it with more people. And after six o'clock, by the way, is when more people are on Facebook typically. Um, Eastern Standard Time is sort of the good indicator for that. Um, so I increase my ad spend almost every day at six o'clock by about 15% on my well-performing ads. And then in the morning I drop it back down again. And I find that I get about 10% um, more clicks per day by doing that. Um, now, most people are like, wow, that's a lot of work to, uh, to, you know, to, to get 10% more clicks. Because on a lot of ads, that might be one or two more. Well, you know, across all of my ads, it might be um, maybe, maybe I get like an, an additional three or four sales by doing that. But I know that my read through, three or four sales, that's $80 to $100 actually for me. So if I can spend you know, 10 minutes every single day at six o'clock tweaking my ads, and then 10 minutes in the morning tweaking them back down and make 100 bucks, yeah, I'll do it. Uh, that may not be as valuable for people who don't. Don't aren't running as many ads and making as aren't making as many sales, but um, I, I do get in there quite a bit. I also run ads currently for three other authors, so I am looking at, at their ads a bunch too. Because they're just trying to <laughs> after this, out. you'll get a bunch of people like, "Hey, how much are you going to charge to run my ads?" <laughs> I don't charge anything to do it, but I'm not taking any more people right now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, but I should say you guys can hit me up on Facebook. I'm, I'm Michael Cooper. Um, on Facebook, there's a lot of Michael Coopers, but I'm the one that I'm the one that looks like me. Um, and I'll, I'll be happy to chat with you guys if anyone has any questions in Facebook Messenger. I guess the people just listening on their podcast will have to come look at the YouTube video in order to ID you now. That's right. Yeah, I'll like uh, I'll I'll change my profile picture on Facebook to have my hands up or something. And uh, okay, I'll just wrap it up here. Last little question: Do you find with the ones that you leave running that you can do that or do you really need to do a new ad every couple months because i know on bookbub i just did it and after a while the ratios go down i think just because like you were saying the same people are seeing it and yeah yeah so yeah it's it's um i have i have obviously you want to watch the ad if it's not getting any clicks and the cost per click is going up uh, you know that's an ad to kill um and i've had a lot of ads that i've killed off i've, I've also had a lot of ads that like i said one's been running since november um and it's uh i, I you had it for a while i had it 50 dollars a day um, now I think it's only spending like seven or eight dollars a day because if I if I go above that I ruin it. But what I did I did some fun things. Like I had this ad, uh, and I've, I've actually periodically I have killed that ad in the U.S. Every now and then I shut it off for a couple of weeks because I'm sure people are sick of seeing it. Um, but I had the ad, and I was only been running it for the U.S. And actually it was a mistake. I didn't even realize I was only running it for the U.S. until one day I went and looked at my stats and I was crap. There's no one outside the U.S. running this. Re you know, looking at this ad, and the funny thing is I did a lookalike audience, and lookalike audiences are always country specific because you have to pick a country. And so I, I made a lookalike audience that was US. And this was actually, this was one that worked well for me, but it was based on a, on a Facebook page, not on a mailing list. Um, and the lookalike audience was US. So even though I picked like Germany and the UK and all sorts of things in my countries, it was still just showing it to people in the US because people outside the US didn't look like people in the US apparently. Um, so anyway, long story short, I took the exact same ad um, and I just duplicated it and I ran it for the UK. And that ad sold um, 3,500 books in a month and a half. Um, and it was an ad that I was like, oh, this ad's tired, it's done, I'm going to get rid of it. Just point at the UK and it just printed money for, for about a month and a half. And then after that, it started to saturate the UK and I, I don't run it there anymore. But um, So you might find that an ad that you thought was no good might have some more life in it. Um, <clears throat> that, that is a very plot-focused ad, which works better for men. I tweaked the text on it a little bit and I ran it for women. Um, and for about five weeks, it did very well for, for a female audience before I, I saturated all the people, I think, that, that were female who were interested in, in that particular ad. So you can a lot of times take an ad, play with it a little bit, you know, maybe swap out the picture and, and you, can, you can breathe their life into it. Awesome. This has been some great information. I feel like I need to go read your book three times, listen to the podcast two times. And the book is called <laughs> Help My Facebook Ad Suck by Michael Cooper. <laughs> Yeah, it's is only six dollars too, so it's it's awesome. awesome. Is there any uh, other site or your site that you want to plug, or any of your sci-fi that you want to plug? This is the audience that might be interested in both. True. Well, I guess there was one other one other note. Um, if anyone's not too tired of hearing me talk, is um, one of the things I, I I did a lot of thinking about when I was writing my series 
is that um, you know I want I want read through from everything. I look at a lot of these authors, especially a lot of authors that are struggling is because they're not they're not staying consistent. So they're doing all this work marketing, you know, to this group of people who read four of their books, and they're doing all this work marketing to another group of people that read these other four books because they're a different genre, they're different characters, or something like that. And it's a lot of work. And I've got ad spend here, and I've got ad spend here, and I said, you know what, I don't want to do that. I want to make it so that I can have two or three books that I advertise, and it's just going to feed into this giant ecosystem of books. Um, and right now. I, I sort of went crazy this year when I went full time. I'm like, hey, I can actually write I, on a good day. I can write 10,000 words a day. And most days I can write five or six, uh, 7,000 words a day. So I realized I could put out two or three novels a month. And so I started doing that. So I think I have like 20 novels or something like that. I'm actually not entirely sure how many I have right now, but it's a stupid number of books considering I, on January 1st, I had four. But what I did is I, I mean, all of my books are in the same universe. Um, they almost all of them have crossover characters. So there's Easter eggs and you're like, oh, you want to know more about this particular story? It happens this other book with these people over here. And the other thing I did is I took those books and I made them to have made them have covers that were specific to certain subgenres, and also themes that are specific to certain subgenres. I will completely butcher that word again, I'm sure. Um, so I and I, that way, what I will do is I say, okay, I want to. There's this big market of people over here who who love manga, who love mechs, you know, who love uh, mechanized warrior, starship trooper stuff. Um, I can now, I'll produce a series of books that are in my overall universe that actually, that get boosted by readers from my regular universe. And I can run ads for authors that I, you know, look, uh, audience of authors I couldn't previously ad advertise for. And they're gonna feed back into my main series as well. So a lot of it was around that. It was like, how can I run ads for all these other people out here that I, that, that I know read these kinds of books and bring them in with the rest of my books. So that's that's a big thing that I did. So, so the universe I write in is called Aeon 14. Um, I named it that because um, in astronomy, an aeon is a billion years, and we are now in aeon 14 of our universe, because uh, we're 13.8 billion. So I'm very, that's very creative uh, of me. So it's called Aeon 14. Um, the main premise of the series is actually that uh, humanity does not discover faster light travel until around the year 4500. Um, in the meantime, humanity learns things like, hey, we can terraform every planet in the solar system if we want to. Um, by the year 4500, they've actually uh, Uranus and, and uh, Neptune are gone, as is as is Mercury, for example, because um, they've actually moved them all around, stuff like that. So the whole idea is that everything you've ever imagined in, that you've read in science fiction novels, you know, quantum entanglement, having AI in your head, the ability to move plants, all of that exists except for FTL. What happens? Uh, and uh, and then it goes from there. You know, there's um, at the at the beginning of the series, there's seven trillion humans living in the soul system. Um, almost none of them live on planets. They all live in orbital constructs and stuff like that. And uh, and so it. And then eventually, the 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 point where the series is right now is in the 90th century, and um, there are 70,000 inhabited planets within 15,000 light years of Earth. Um, so there's just like an infinite setting, basically. There's worlds where people are fighting with swords, you know, and and, and riding on horses. And there's worlds where people, you know, are brains in jars, you know. And there's worlds where people are dolphins. They just you know, we're all going to be dolphins now. Um, stuff like that. So it's kind of neat. So it gives me infinite setting, allows me to cross all these things over together, and then allows me to run ads that target, you know, all these different subgenres and, and bring them into the whole verse. So that's 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 what I'm doing there. And I, and I write under MD Cooper on Amazon. All right, very cool. I will link to that as well as to Michael Cooper's Facebook ads book. <laughs> and uh, I, I appreciate you mentioning that at the end because I was thinking too, like my pen name, I'll probably try this with it because it's all science fiction romance with the exception that there was a dragon story in there somewhere. But with myself, you know, I'm like, here's a little steampunk. Oh, let's try some space opera, you know, oh, urban fantasy, sure. So I know that it's, yeah. you know, the art artist side sometimes wins out over the smart entrepreneurial yeah. side. I should say most of the time wins out. But, well, that's, that's, that's sort of maybe a piece of advice there, you know, which won't work any at this point for you. But for folks you know, who are thinking about that is try and construct a universe that can support all these different subgenres. Um, like what Michael Anderley is doing, for example, with his um, Cuthering Gambit thing. You know, they've got everything from spaceships to, to sword and sorcery magic, and it's all in one universe. So they can, they can write the whole gamut and bring these readers in that, that read everything, you know, read all these different things and cross them over. And then you can kind of get the artist and you can play around and, and the entrepreneur and you can, can make some money while you're doing it. Yeah, sounds good. And uh, I am fortunate enough, a lot of people read them all just because of the character driven kind of stories. But for the ads, I can see where like, okay, just I'll get everybody that likes sci-fi romance, you know, and then there's 12 books or whatever she has out now. And they're all, you're all going to like all of them if you like those. So yeah. Makes exactly. Sense yeah. So one ad feeds into all twelve books, mm -hmm. which is a way better ROI than having to run six ads, you know, feeding into into twelve books. 
Awesome. Well, I'll stop asking you questions now. Do you guys have oh, anything yeah. <laughs> else that you want to throw in there before we let Michael go for the night? Uh, I think we might have hit a saturation point. I was like, okay, there's so I'm looking at my pages and pages of notes are gone. Yeah, I'm going to be listening <laughs> to this one a while for a few more times. Definitely. Yeah, I'd say I'm done. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you for listening, everyone. I hope you got a lot of good information out, the, out of this. I know I did. And I feel like you should probably be charging more than six dollars for your book, Michael, and, <laughs> and maybe for some webinars if you uh, if you ever aspire to do that. <laughs> well, thanks for all that, uh, Michael. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you very much. All right, thanks everyone for listening. Yeah. Oh, and this is episode 147. Come on by marketingsff.com if you need any of the links, and I will point you to Michael's stuff. Thanks everyone. Thank you, so everybody. Take it easy. Bye.